Chapter Forty Three of the Yellow Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. The Yellow Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter Forty Three, Thumbelina. There was once a woman who wanted to have quite a tiny little child, but she did not know where to get one from. So one day she went to an old witch and said to her, "I should so much like to have a tiny little child. Can you tell me where I can get one?" "Oh, we have just got one ready," said the witch. "Here is a barley corn for you, but it's not the kind the farmer sows in his field or feeds the cocks and hens with. I can tell you. Put it in a flower pot, and then you will see something happen." "Oh, thank you," said the woman, and gave the witch a shilling for that was what it cost. Then she went home and planted the barley corn. Immediately there grew out of it a large and beautiful flower, which looked like a tulip, but the petals were tightly closed as if it were still only a bud. What a beautiful flower! Exclaimed the woman, and she kissed the red and yellow petals. But as she kissed them, the flower burst open. It was a real tulip, such as one can see any day, but in the middle of the blossom, on the green velvety petals, sat a little girl, quite tiny, trim, and pretty. She was scarcely half a thumb in height, so they called her Thumbelina. An elegant polished walnut shell served Thumbelina as a cradle. The blue petals of a violet were her mattress, and a rose leaf her coverlid. There she lay at night, but in the daytime she used to play about on the table. Here the woman had put a bowl surrounded by a ring of flowers, with their stalks in water, in the middle of which floated a great tulip petal. And on this Thumbelina sat and sailed from one side of the bowl to the other, rowing herself with two white horse hairs for oars. It was such a pretty sight. She could sing too with a voice that was more soft and sweet than ever had been heard before. One night, when she was lying in her pretty little bed, an old toad crept in through a broken pane in the window. She was very ugly, clumsy, and clammy. She hopped onto the table where Thumbelina lay asleep under the red rose leaf. This would make a beautiful wife for my son," said the toad, taking up the walnut shell with Thumbelina inside, and hopping with it through the window into the garden. There flowed a great wide stream, with slippery and marshy banks. Here the toad lived with her son. Oh, how ugly and clammy he was, just like his mother! Croak, croak, croak was all he could say when he saw the pretty little girl in the walnut shell. Don't talk so loud, or you'll wake her," said the old toad. "She might escape us even now. She is as light as a feather. We will put her at once on a broad water lily leaf in the stream. That will be quite an island for her. She is so small and light. She can't run away from us there, whilst we are preparing the guest chamber under the marsh where she will live. Outside in the brook grew many water lilies with broad green leaves, which looked as if they were swimming about on the water. The leaf farthest away was the largest, and to this the old toad swam with Thumbelina in her walnut shell. The tiny Thumbelina woke up very early in the morning, and when she saw where she was, she began to cry bitterly, for on every side of the great green leaf was water, and she could not get to the land. The old toad was down under the marsh, decorating her room with rushes and yellow marigold leaves to make it very grand for her new daughter-in-law. Then she swam out with her ugly son to the leaf where Thumbelina lay. She wanted to fetch the pretty cradle to put into her room before Thumbelina herself came there. The old toad bowed low in the water before her and said, "Here is my son. You shall marry him and live in great magnificence down under the marsh." Croak, 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 was all that the son could say. Then they took the neat little cradle and swam away with it, but Thumbelina sat alone on the great green leaf and wept. For she did not want to live with the clammy toad or marry her ugly son. The little fishes swimming about under the water had seen the toad quite plainly, and heard what she said, so they put up their heads to see the little girl. When they saw her, they thought her so pretty that they were very sorry she should go down with the ugly toad to live. No, that must not happen. They assembled in the water round the green stalk which supported the leaf on which she was sitting, and nibbled the stem in two. Away floated the leaf down the stream, bearing Thumbelina far beyond the reach of the toad. On she sailed past several towns, 
and the little birds sitting in the bushes saw her and sang, What a pretty little girl! The leaf floated farther and farther away, thus Thumbelina left her native land. A beautiful little white butterfly fluttered above her, and at last settled on the leaf. Thumbelina pleased him, and she, too, was delighted, for now the toads could not reach her, and it was so beautiful where she was travelling. The sun shone on the water and made it sparkle like the brightest silver. She took off her sash and tied one end round the butterfly, the other end she fastened to the leaf, so that now it glided along with her faster than ever. A great cockchafer came flying past. He caught sight of Thumbelina, and in a moment had put his arms round her slender waist, and had flown off with her to a tree. The green leaf floated away down the stream, and the butterfly with it, for he was fastened to the leaf, and could not get loose from it. Oh, dear, how terrified poor little Thumbelina was when the cockchafer flew off with her to the tree! But she was especially distressed on the beautiful white butterfly's account, as she had tied him so fast that if he could not get away he must starve to death. But the cockchafer did not trouble himself about that. He sat down with her on a large green leaf, gave her the honey out of the flowers to eat, and told her that she was very pretty, although she wasn't in the least like a cockchafer. Later on, all the cockchafers who lived in the same tree came to pay calls. They examined Thumbelina closely and remarked, Why, she has only two legs! How very miserable! She has no feelers, cried another. How ugly she is, said all the lady chafers. And yet Thumbelina was really very pretty. The cockchafer who had stolen her knew this very well. But when he heard all the ladies saying she was ugly, he began to think so too, and would not keep her. She might go wherever she liked. So he flew down from the tree with her and put her on a daisy. There she sat and wept, because she was so ugly that the cockchafer would have nothing to do with her. And yet she was the most beautiful creature imaginable, so soft and delicate, like the loveliest rose leaf. The whole summer poor little Thumbelina lived alone in the great wood. She plaited a bed for herself of blades of grass, and hung it up under a clover leaf, so that she was protected from the rain. She gathered honey from the flowers for food, and drank the dew on the leaves every morning. Thus the summer and autumn passed, but then came winter, the long, cold winter. All the birds who had sung so sweetly about her had flown away. The trees shed their leaves, the flowers died. The great clover leaf under which she had lived curled up, and nothing remained of it but the withered stalk. She was terribly cold, for her clothes were ragged and she herself was so small and thin. Poor little Thumbelina, she would surely be frozen to death. It began to snow, and every snowflake that fell on her was to her as a whole shovelful thrown on one of us, for we are so big, and she was only an inch high. She wrapped herself round in a dead leaf, but it was torn in the middle and gave her no warmth. She was trembling with cold. Just outside the wood where she was now living lay a great cornfield, but the corn had been gone a long time. Only the dry, bare stubble was left standing in the frozen ground. This made a forest for her to wander about in. All at once she came to the door of a field mouse, who had a little hole under a cornstalk. There the mouse lived warm and snug, with a storeroom full of corn, a splendid kitchen and dining room. Poor little Thumbelina went up to the door and begged for a little piece of barley, for she had not had anything to eat for the last two days. "'Poor little creature,' said the field mouse, for she was a kind-hearted old thing at the bottom. "'Come into my warm room and have some dinner with me.' As Thumbelina pleased her, she said, "'As far as I am concerned, you may spend the winter with me, but you must keep my room clean and tidy, and tell me stories, for I like that very much.' And Thumbelina did all that the kind old field mouse asked, and did it remarkably well, too. "'Now I am expecting a visitor,' said the field mouse. "'My neighbour comes to call on me once a week. "'He is in better circumstances than I am, "'and has great big rooms, and wears a fine black velvet coat. "'If you could only marry him, you would be well provided for. "'But he is blind. "'You must tell him all the prettiest stories you know.' "'But Thumbelina did not trouble her head about him, "'for he was only a mole. "'He came and paid them a visit in his black velvet coat. "'He is so rich and so accomplished,' the field mouse told her. His house is twenty times larger than mine. He possesses great knowledge, but he cannot bear the sun and the beautiful flowers, and speaks slightingly of them, for he has never seen them. 
Thumbelina had to sing to him, so she sang Lady Bird, Lady Bird, Fly Away Home, and other songs so prettily that the mole fell in love with her. But he did not say anything. He was a very cautious man. A short time before he had dug a long passage through the ground from his own house to that of his neighbour. In this he gave the field mouse and Thumbelina permission to walk as often as they liked. But he begged them not to be afraid of the dead bird that lay in the passage. It was a real bird with beak and feathers, and must have died a little time ago, and now lay buried just where he had made his tunnel. The mole took a piece of rotten wood in his mouth, for that glows like fire in the dark, and went in front, lighting them through the long dark passage. When they came to the place where the dead bird lay, the mole put his broad nose against the ceiling and pushed a hole through, so that the daylight could shine down. In the middle of the path lay a dead swallow, his pretty wings pressed close to his sides, his claws and head drawn under his feathers. The poor bird had evidently died of cold. Thumbelina was very sorry, for she was very fond of all little birds. They had sung and twittered so beautifully to her all through the summer. But the mole kicked him with his bandy legs, and said, Now he can't sing any more. Must be very miserable to be a little bird. I'm thankful that none of my little children are. Birds always starve in winter. Yes, you speak like a sensible man, said the field mouse. What has a bird, in spite of all his singing, in the winter time? He must starve and freeze, and that must be very pleasant for him, I must say. The Melina did not say anything, but when the other two had passed on, she bent down to the bird, brushed aside the feathers from his head, and kissed his closed eyes gently. Perhaps it was he that sang to me so prettily in the summer, she thought. Oh, how much pleasure he did give me, dear little bird! The mole closed up the hole again, which led in the light, and then escorted the ladies home. But Thumbelina could not sleep that night, so she got out of bed and plaited a great big blanket of straw, and carried it off and spread it over the dead bird, and piled upon it thistle-down as soft as cotton wool, which she had found in the field mouse's room, so that the poor little thing should lie warmly buried. "'Farewell, pretty little bird,' she said. "'Farewell, and thank you for your beautiful songs in the summer.' when the trees were green and the sun shone down warmly on us. Then she laid her head against the bird's heart. But the bird was not dead. He had been frozen, but now that she had warmed him, he was coming to life again. In autumn the swallows fly away to foreign lands, but there are some who are late in starting, and then they get so cold that they drop down as if dead, and the snow comes and covers them over. Thumbelina trembled, she was so frightened for the bird was very large in comparison with herself, only an inch high. But she took courage, piled up the down more closely over the poor swallow, fetched her own coverlid and laid it over his head. Next night she crept out again to him. There he was alive, but very weak. He could only open his eyes for a moment and look at Thumbelina, who was standing in front of him with a piece of rotten wood in her hand, for she had no other lantern. "'Thank you, pretty little child,' said the swallow to her. I am beautifully warm. Soon I shall regain my strength, and then I shall be able to fly out again into the warm sunshine. Oh, she said, it is very cold outside. It is snowing and freezing. Stay in your warm bed. I will take care of you. Then she brought him water in a petal, which he drank, after which he related to her how he had torn one of his wings on a bramble, so that he could not fly as fast as the other swallows, who had flown far away to warmer lands. So at last he had dropped down exhausted, and then he could remember no more. The whole winter he remained down there, and Thumbelina looked after him and nursed him tenderly. Neither the mole nor the field mouse learnt anything of this, for they could not bear the poor swallow. When the spring came and the sun warmed the earth again, the swallow said farewell to Thumbelina, who opened the hole in the roof for him which the mole had made. The sun shone brightly down upon her and the swallow asked her if she would go with him. She could sit upon his back. Thumbelina wanted very much to fly far away into the green wood, but she knew that the old field mouse would be sad if she ran away. No, I mustn't come, she said. Farewell, dear good little girl, said the swallow, and flew off into the sunshine. Thumbelina gazed after him with the tears standing in her eyes, for she was very fond of the swallow. Tweet, tweet, sang the bird, and flew into the green wood. Thumbelina was very unhappy. She was not allowed to go out into the warm sunshine. 
The corn, which had been sowed in the field over the field mouse's home, grew high up into the air, and made a thick forest for the poor little girl, who was only an inch high. "'Now you are to be a bride, Thumbelina,' said the field mouse, "'for our neighbour has proposed for you. What a piece of fortune for a poor child like you! Now you must set to work at your linen for your dowry, for nothing must be lacking if you are to become the wife of our neighbour the mole.' Thumbelina had to spin all day long, and every evening the mole visited her, and told her that when the summer was over the sun would not shine so hot. Now it was burning the earth as hard as a stone. Yes, when the summer had passed they would keep the wedding. But she was not at all pleased about it, for she did not like the stupid mole. Every morning when the sun was rising, and every evening when it was setting, she would steal out of the house door and when the breeze parted the ears of corn so that she could see the blue sky through them, she thought how bright and beautiful it must be outside, and longed to see her dear swallow again. But he never came. No doubt he had flown away far into the great green wood. By the autumn Thumbelina had finished the dowry. "'In four weeks you will be married,' said the field mouse. "'Don't be obstinate, or I shall bite you with my sharp white teeth. "'You will get a fine husband.' The king himself has not such a velvet coat. His storeroom and cellar are full, and you should be thankful for that. Well, the wedding day arrived. The mole had come to fetch Thumbelina to live with him deep down under the ground, never to come out into the warm sun again, for that was what he didn't like. The poor little girl was very sad, for now she must say goodbye to the beautiful sun. Farewell, bright sun, she cried, stretching out her arms toward it and taking another step outside the house, for now the corn had been reaped, and only the dry stubble was left standing. Farewell, farewell, she said, and put her arms around a red flower that grew there. Give my love to the dear swallow when you see him. Tweet, tweet, sounded in her ear all at once. She looked up. There was the swallow flying past. As soon as he saw Thumbelina he was very glad. She told him how unwilling she was to marry the ugly mole, as then she had to live underground where the sun never shone, and she could not help bursting into tears. "'The cold winter is coming now,' said the swallow. "'I must fly away to warmer lands. Will you come with me? You can sit on my back, and we will fly far away from the ugly mole in his dark house, over the mountains, to the warm countries where the sun shines more brightly than here, where it is always summer, and there are always beautiful flowers. Do come with me, dear little Thumbelina.' who saved my life when I lay frozen in the dark tunnel. "'Yes, I will go with you,' said Thumbelina, and got on the swallow's back, with her feet on one of his outstretched wings. Up he flew into the air, over woods and seas, over the great mountains where the snow is always lying. And if she was cold, she crept under his warm feathers, only keeping her little head out to admire all the beautiful things in the world beneath. At last they came to the warm lands. There the sun was brighter, the sky seemed twice as high, and in the hedges hung the finest green and purple grapes. In the woods grew oranges and lemons. The air was scented with myrtle and mint, and on the roads were pretty little children running about and playing with great gorgeous butterflies. But the swallow flew further on, and it became more and more beautiful. Under the most splendid green trees beside a blue lake stood a glittering white marble castle. Vines hung about the high pillars. There were many swallows' nests, and in one of these lived the swallow who was carrying Thumbelina. "'Here is my house,' said he, "'but it won't do for you to live with me. I am not tidy enough to please you. Find a home for yourself in one of the lovely flowers that grow down there. Now I will set you down, and you can do whatever you like.' "'That will be splendid,' said she, clapping her little hands. There lay a great white marble column which had fallen to the ground and broken into three pieces. But between these grew the most beautiful white flowers. The swallow flew down with Thumbelina and set her upon one of the broad leaves. But there, to her astonishment, she found a tiny little man sitting in the middle of the flower, as white and transparent as if he were made of glass. He had the prettiest golden crown on his head, and the most beautiful wings on his shoulders. He himself was no bigger than Thumbelina. He was the spirit of the flower. In each blossom there dwelt a tiny man or woman but this one was the king over the others. "'How handsome he is!' whispered Thumbelina to the swallow. The little prince was very much frightened at the swallow, for in comparison with one so tiny as himself he seemed a giant. 
but when he saw Thumbelina he was delighted, for she was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. So he took his golden crown from off his head and put it on hers, asking her her name, and if she would be his wife, and then she would be queen of all the flowers. Yes, he was a different kind of husband to the son of the toad and the mole with the black velvet coat. She said yes to the noble prince, and out of each flower came a lady and gentleman, each so tiny and pretty that it was a pleasure to see them. Each brought Thumbelina a present, but the best of all was a beautiful pair of wings which were fastened onto her back, and now she too could fly from flower to flower. They all wished her joy, and the swallow sat above in his nest and sang the wedding march, and that he did as well as he could. But he was sad, because he was very fond of Thumbelina and did not want to be separated from her. "'You shall not be called Thumbelina,' said the spirit of the flower to her. "'That is an ugly name, and you are much too pretty for that. We will call you May Blossom." "'Farewell, farewell,' said the little swallow with a heavy heart, and flew away to further lands, far, far away, right back to Denmark. There he had a little nest above a window where his wife lived, who can tell fairy stories. "'Tweet, tweet,' he sang to her. And that is the way we learnt the whole story." End of chapter 43「In China, as I dare say you know, the emperor is a Chinaman, and all his courtiers are also Chinamen. The story I am going to tell you happened many years ago, but it is worth while for you to listen to it, before it is forgotten. The emperor's palace was the most splendid in the world, all made of priceless porcelain, but so brittle and delicate that you had to take great care how you touched it. In the garden there were the most beautiful flowers, and on the loveliest of them were tied silver bells which tinkled, so that if you passed you could not help looking at the flowers. Everything in the emperor's garden was admirably arranged with a view to effect, and the garden was so large that even the gardener himself did not know where it ended. If you ever got beyond it, you came to a stately forest with great trees and deep lakes in it. The forest sloped down to the sea, which was a clear blue. Large ships could sail under the boughs of the trees, and in these trees there lived a nightingale. She sang so beautifully that even the poor fisherman who had so much to do stood and listened when he came at night to cast his nets. "'How beautiful it is!' he said, but he had to attend to his work and forgot about the bird. But when she sang the next night and the fisherman came there again, he said the same thing. "'How beautiful it is!' From all the countries round came travellers to the emperor's town, who were astonished at the palace and the garden. But when they heard the nightingale, they all said, "'This is the finest thing, after all.' The travellers told all about it when they went home, and learned scholars wrote many books upon the town, the palace, and the garden. But they did not forget the nightingale, and all the poets composed splendid verses on the nightingale in the forest by the deep sea. The books were circulated throughout the world, and some of them reached the emperor. He sat in his golden chair and read and read. He nodded his head every moment, for he liked reading the brilliant accounts of the town, the palace, and the garden. "'But the nightingale is better than all,' he saw written. "'What is that?' said the emperor. "'I don't know anything about the nightingale. Is there such a bird in my empire and so near as in my garden? I have never heard it.' "'Fancy reading for the first time about it in a book!' And he called his first lord to him. He was so proud that if any one of lower rank than his own ventured to speak to him or ask him anything, he would say nothing but, "'Puh!' And that does not mean anything. "'Here is a most remarkable bird which is called a nightingale,' said the emperor. "'They say it is the most glorious thing in my kingdom. Why has no one ever said anything to me about it?' "'I have never before heard it mentioned,' said the first lord. I will look for it and find it. But where was it to be found? The First Lord ran up and down stairs, through the halls and corridors, but none of those he met had ever heard of the nightingale, and the First Lord ran again to the Emperor and told him that it must be an invention on the part of those who had written those books. 
your imperial majesty cannot really believe all that is written there are some inventions called the black art but the book in which i read this said the emperor is sent me by his great majesty the emperor of japan so it cannot be untrue and i will hear the nightingale she must be here this evening she has my gracious permission to appear and if she does not the whole court shall be trampled under foot after supper tsing pei said the first lord and he ran down the stairs through the halls and corridors and half the court ran with him for they did not want to be trampled under foot every one was asking after the wonderful nightingale which all the world knew of except those at court at last they met a poor little girl in the kitchen who said oh i know the nightingale well how she sings i have permission to carry the scraps over from the court meals to my poor sick mother and when i am going home at night tired and weary and rest for a little in the wood then i hear the nightingale singing it brings tears to my eyes and i feel as if my mother were kissing me little kitchen-maid said the first lord i will give you a place in the kitchen and you shall have leave to see the emperor at dinner if you can lead us to the nightingale for she is invited to come to court this evening and so they all went into the wood where the nightingale was wont to sing and half the court went too when they were on the way there they heard a cow mooing oh said the courtiers now we have found her what a wonderful power for such a small beast to have i am sure we have heard her before no that is a cow mooing said the little kitchen-maid we are still a long way off then the frogs began to croak in the marsh splendid said the chinese chaplain now we hear her it sounds like a little church bell no no those are frogs said the little kitchen-maid but i think we shall soon hear her now then the nightingale began to sing there she is cried the little girl listen she is sitting there and she pointed to a little dark grey bird up in the branches is it possible said the first lord i should never have thought it how ordinary she looks she must surely have lost her feathers because she sees so many distinguished men round her little nightingale called out the little kitchen-maid our gracious emperor wants you to sing before him with the greatest of pleasure said the nightingale and she sang so gloriously that it was a pleasure to listen it sounds like glass bells said the first lord and look how her little throat works it is wonderful that we have never heard her before she will be a great success at court shall i sing once more for the emperor asked the little nightingale thinking that the emperor was there my esteemed little nightingale said the first lord i have the great pleasure to invite you to court this evening where his gracious imperial highness will be enchanted with your charming song it sounds best in the green wood said the nightingale but still she came gladly when she heard that the emperor wished it at the palace everything was splendidly prepared the porcelain walls and floors glittered in the light of many thousand gold lamps the most gorgeous flowers which tinkled out well were placed in the corridors there was such a hurrying and draught that all the bells jingled so much that one could not hear oneself speak in the centre of the great hall where the emperor sat was a golden perch on which the nightingale sat the whole court was there and the little kitchen-maid was allowed to stand behind the door now that she was a court cook every one was dressed in his best and every one was looking towards the little grey bird to whom the emperor nodded the nightingale sang so gloriously that the tears came into the emperor's eyes and ran down his cheeks then the nightingale sang even more beautifully it went straight to all hearts the emperor was so delighted that he said she should wear his gold slipper round her neck but the nightingale thanked him and said she had had enough reward already i have seen tears in the emperor's eyes that is a great reward an emperor's tears have such power then she sang again with her gloriously sweet voice that is the most charming coquetry i have ever seen said all the ladies round and they all took to holding water in their mouths that they might gurgle whenever anyone spoke to them then they thought themselves nightingales yes the lackeys and chambermaids announced that they were pleased which means a great deal for they are the most difficult people of all to satisfy in short the nightingale was a real success she had to stay at court now she had her own cage and permission to walk out twice in the day and once at night she was given twelve servants who each held a silken string which was fastened around her leg there was little pleasure in flying about like this the whole town was talking about the wonderful bird and when two people met each other one would say nighton and the other gale and then they would both sigh and understand one another 
Yes, and eleven grocer's children were called after her, but not one of them could sing a note. One day the emperor received a large parcel on which was written, The Nightingale. Here is another new book about our famous bird, said the emperor. But it was not a book, but a little mechanical toy which lay in a box, an artificial nightingale which was like the real one, only that it was set all over with diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. When it was wound up, it could sing the piece the real bird sang, and moved its tail up and down, and glittered with silver and gold. Round its neck was a little collar on which was written, The nightingale of the Emperor of Japan is nothing compared to that of the Emperor of China. This is magnificent, they all said, and the man who had brought the clockwork bird received on the spot the title of Bringer of the Imperial First Nightingale. Now they must sing together. What a duet we shall have! And so they sang together. But their voices did not blend, for the real nightingale sang in her way, and the clockwork bird sang waltzes. "'It is not its fault,' said the bandmaster. "'It keeps very good time, and is quite after my style.' Then the artificial bird had to sing alone. It gave just as much pleasure as the real one, and then it was so much prettier to look at. It sparkled like bracelets and necklaces. Three and thirty times it sang the same piece without being tired." People would like to have heard it again, but the emperor thought that the living nightingale should sing now. But where was she? No one had noticed that she had flown out of the open window away to her green woods. "'What shall we do?' said the emperor. And all the court scolded and said that the nightingale was very ungrateful. "'But we have still the best bird,' they said. And the artificial bird had to sing again, and that was the thirty-fourth time they had heard the same piece." but they did not yet know it by heart. It was much too difficult, and the bandmaster praised the bird tremendously. Yes, he assured them, it was better than a real nightingale, not only because of its beautiful plumage and diamonds, but inside as well. For see, my lords and ladies, and your imperial majesty, with the real nightingale one can never tell what will come out, but all is known about the artificial bird. You can explain it, you can open it and show people where the waltzes lie, how they go, and how one follows the other." "'That's just what we think,' said everyone, and the bandmaster received permission to show the bird to the people the next Sunday. "'They should hear it sing,' commanded the emperor. And they heard it, and they were as pleased as if they had been intoxicated with tea, after the Chinese fashion, and they all said, "'Oh!' and held up their forefingers and nodded time. But the poor fisherman who had heard the real nightingale said, "'This one sings well enough. The tune glides out, but there is something wanting. I, I don't know what.' The real nightingale was banished from the kingdom. The artificial bird was put on silken cushions by the emperor's bed. All the presents which it received, gold and precious stones, lay round it, and it was given the title of Imperial Night Singer, first from the left. For the emperor counted that side as the more distinguished, being the side on which the heart is. The emperor's heart is also on the left. And the bandmaster wrote a work of twenty-five volumes about the artificial bird, it was so learned, long, and so full of the hardest Chinese words that everyone said they had read it and understood it. For once they had been very stupid about a book, and had been trampled under foot in consequence. So a whole year passed. The emperor, the court, and all the Chinese knew every note of the artificial bird's song by heart, but they liked it all the better for this. They could even sing with it, and they did. The street boys sang, tra-la-la-la-la, and the emperor sang too sometimes. It was indeed delightful. But one evening, when the artificial bird was singing its best, and the emperor lay in bed listening to it, something in the bird went, crack! Something snapped! Whirr! All the wheels ran down, and then the music ceased. The emperor sprang up and had his physician summoned, but what could he do? Then the clockmaker came, and, after a great deal of talking and examining, he put the bird somewhat in order, but he said that it must be very seldom used as the works were nearly worn out, and it was impossible to put in new ones. Here was a calamity. Only once a year was the artificial bird allowed to sing, and even that was almost too much for it. But then the bandmaster made a little speech full of hard words, saying that it was just as good as before, and so, of course, it was just as good as before. So five years passed, and then a great sorrow came to the nation. The Chinese look upon their emperor as everything, and now he was ill, and not likely to live, it was said. Already a new emperor had been chosen, and the people stood outside in the street and asked the first lord how the old emperor was. Phew, he said, and shook his head. 
cold and pale lay the emperor in his splendid great bed the whole court believed him dead and one after the other left him to pay their respects to the new emperor everywhere in the halls and corridors cloth was laid down so that no footsteps could be heard and everything was still very very still and nothing came to break the silence the emperor longed for something to come and relieve the monotony of this death-like stillness if only someone would speak to him if only someone would sing to him music would carry his thoughts away and would break the spell lying on him the moon was streaming in at the open window but that too was silent quite silent music music cried the emperor you little bright golden bird sing do sing i gave you gold and jewels i have hung my gold slipper around your neck with my own hand sing do sing but the bird was silent there was no one to wind it up and so it could not sing and all was silent so terribly silent all at once there came in at the window the most glorious burst of song it was the little living nightingale who sitting outside on a bough had heard the need of her emperor and had come to sing to him of comfort and hope and as she sang the blood flowed quicker and quicker in the emperor's weak limbs and life began to return thank you thank you said the emperor you divine little bird i know you i chased you from my kingdom and you have given me life again how can i reward you you have done that already said the nightingale i brought tears to your eyes the first time i sang i shall never forget that they are jewels that rejoice a singer's heart but now sleep and get strong again i will sing you a lullaby and the emperor fell into a deep calm sleep as she sang the sun was shining through the window when he awoke strong and well none of his servants had come back yet for they thought he was dead but the nightingale sat and sang to him you must always stay with me said the emperor you shall sing whenever you like and i will break the artificial bird into a thousand pieces don't do that said the nightingale he did his work as long as he could keep him as you have done i cannot build my nest in the palace and live here but let me come whenever i like i will sit in the evening on the bough outside the window and i will sing you something that will make you feel happy and grateful i will sing of joy and of sorrow i will sing of evil and the good which lies hidden from you the little singing bird flies all around to the poor fisherman's hut to the farmer's cottage to all those who are far away from you and your court i love your heart more than your crown though that has about it a brightness of something holy now i will sing to you again but you must promise me one thing anything said the emperor standing up in his imperial robes which he had himself put on and fastening on his sword richly embossed with gold one thing i beg of you don't tell anyone that you have a little bird who tells you everything it will be much better not to then the nightingale flew away the servants came in to look at their dead emperor. The emperor said, Good morning. End of chapter 44。Chapter 45 of the Yellow Fairy Book。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caliban. The Yellow Fairy Book, edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter 45 Hermod and Hadvor, from the Icelandic. Once upon a time, there were a king and a queen who had an only daughter called Hadvor, who was fair and beautiful, and being an only child, was heir to the kingdom. The king and queen also had a foster son named Hermod, who was just about the same age as Hadvor, and was good-looking, as well as clever at most things. Hermod and Hadvor often played together while they were children, and liked each other so much that while they were still young, they secretly plighted their troth to each other. As time went on, the queen fell sick and, suspecting that it was her last illness, sent for the king to come to her. When he came, she told him that she had no long time to live, 
and therefore wished to ask one thing of him, which was that if he married another wife, he should promise to take no other than the Queen of Hetland the Good. The king gave the promise, and thereafter the queen died. Time went past, and the king, growing tired of living alone, fitted out his ship and sailed out to sea. As he sailed, there came upon him so thick a mist that he altogether lost his bearings. But after a long trouble he found land. There he laid his ship to, and went on shore all alone. After walking for some time he came to a forest, into which he went a little way and stopped. Then he heard sweet music from a harp, and went in the direction of the sound until he came to a clearing. And there he saw three women, one of whom sat on a golden chair and was beautifully and grandly dressed. She held a harp in her hands and was very sorrowful. The second was also finely dressed, but younger in appearance, and also sat on a chair, but it was not so grand as the first ones. The third stood beside them, and was very pretty to look at. She had a green cloak over her other clothes, and it was easy to see that she was a maid to the other two. After the king had looked at them for a little while, he went forward and saluted them. The one that sat on the golden chair asked him who he was and where he was going. He told her all the story, how he was a king and had lost his queen, and was now on his way to Hetland the Good to ask the queen of that country in marriage. She answered that fortune had contrived this wonderfully, for pirates had plundered Hetland and killed the king, and she had fled from the land in terror, and had come hither after great trouble. And she was the very person he was looking for, and the others were his daughter and maid. The king immediately asked her hand. She gladly received his proposal and accepted him at once. Thereafter they all set out and made their way to the ship, and after that nothing is told of their voyage until the king reached his own country. There he made a great feast and celebrated his marriage with this woman, and after that things are quiet for a time. Hermod and Hadwar took but little notice of the queen and her daughter, but... On the other hand, Hadvor and the queen's mate, whose name was Olaf, were very friendly, and Olaf came often to visit Hadvor in her castle. But before long the king went out to war, and no sooner was he away than the queen came to talk with Hermod, and said that she wanted him to marry her daughter. Hermod told her straight and plain he would not do so, at which the queen grew terribly angry and said that in that case neither should he have had for, for she would now lay the spell on him, that he should go to a desert island, and there be a lion by day and a man by night. He should also always think of Hadvor, which would cause him all the more sorrow, and from this spell he would never be freed until Hadvor burned the lion's skin, and that would not happen very soon. As soon as the queen had finished her speech, Hermod replied that he also laid a spell on her, and that was that as soon as he was freed from her enchantments, she should become a rat and her daughter a mouse, and fight with each other in the hall until he had killed them with his sword. After this Hermod disappeared, and no one knew what had become of him. The queen caused search to be made for him. He could nowhere be found. One time when Olaf was in the castle beside Hadvor, she asked the princess if he knew where Hermod had gone to. At this Hadvor became very sad and said that she did not. I shall tell you then, said Olaf, for I know all about it. Hermod has disappeared from the wicked devices of the queen, for she is a witch and so is her daughter, though they have put on these beautiful forms. Because Hermod would not fall in love with the queen's plans and marry her daughter, she has laid a spell on him to go on an island and be a lion by day and a man by night, and never be freed from this until you burn the lion's skin. Besides, said Olaf, she has looked out for a match for you, and she has a brother in the underworld, a three 
headed giant whom she means to turn into a beautiful prince and get him married to you. This is no new thing for the queen. She took me away from my parents' house and compelled me to serve her, but she has never done me any harm, for the green cloak I wear protects me against all mischief. Hadpore now became still sadder than before at the thought of the marriage destined for her, and entreated Olaf to think of some plan to save her. I think, said Olaf, that your wooer will come up through the floor of the castle to you, and so you must be prepared when you hear the noise of his coming, and the floor begins to open, and have at hand blazing pitch, and pour plenty of it into the opening. That will prove too much for him. About this time the king came home from his expedition, and thought it a great blow that no one knew what had become of Hermod. But the queen consoled him as best she could, and after a time the king thought less about the disappearance. Hadbor remained in her castle, and had made preparations to receive her wooer when he came. One night, not long after, a loud noise and rumbling was heard underneath the castle. Hadbor at once guessed what it was and told her maids to be ready to help her. The noise and the thundering grew louder and louder until the floor began to open, whereupon Hadbor had them take the cauldron of pitch and pour plenty of it into the opening. With that the noises grew fainter and fainter, till at last they ceased altogether. Next morning the queen rose early and went out to the palace gate, and there she found her brother the giant lying dead. She went up to him and said, I pronounce this spell that you become a beautiful prince and that Hadwar shall be unable to say anything against the charges I shall bring against her. The body of the dead giant now became that of a beautiful prince, and the queen went in again. I don't think, said she to the king, that your daughter is as good as she said to be. My brother came and asked her hand, and she had him put to death. I have found his dead body lying at the palace gate. The king went along with the queen to see the body, and thought it all very strange. So beautiful a youth, he said, would have been a worthy match for Hadpore, and he would readily have agreed to their marriage. The queen asked leave to decide what Hadvor's punishment should be, which the king was very willing to allow, so as to escape from punishing his own daughter. The queen's decision was that the king should make a big grave mound for her brother, and put Hadvor into it beside him. Olaf knew all the plans of the queen, and went to tell the princess what had been done whereupon Hadvor earnestly entreated her to tell her what to do. First and foremost, said Olaf, you must get a wide cloak to wear over your other clothes when you are put into the mound. The giant's ghost will walk after you are both left together in there, and he will have two dogs along with him. He will ask you to cut pieces out of his legs to give to the dogs. That you must not promise to do unless he tells you where Hamid has gone to, and tells you how to find him. He will then let you stand on his shoulders so as to get out of the mound, but he means to cheat you all the same, and will catch you by the cloak to pull you back again. But you must take care to have the cloak loose on your shoulders, so that he will only get hold of that. The mound was all ready now, and the giant laid in it and into it Hadvor had to go without being allowed to make any defense. After they were both left there, everything happened just as Olaf had said. The prince became a giant again, and asked Hadvor to cut the pieces out of his legs for the dogs. This she refused, until he told her that Hermod was in a desert island, which she could not reach unless she took the skin off the soles of his feet and made shoes out of that. With these shoes she could travel both on land and sea. This Hadbor now did, and the giant then let her up on his shoulders to get out of the mound. As she sprang out, he caught hold of her cloak, but she had taken care to let it lie loose on her shoulders, and so escaped. She now made her way down to the sea, 
to where she knew there was the shortest distance over to the island to which Hermit was. The strait she easily crossed with the shoes kept her up. On reaching the island she found a sandy beach all along by the sea, and high cliffs above. Nor could she see any way to get up these, and so, being both sad at heart and tired with the long journey, she lay down and fell asleep. As she slept, she dreamed that a tall woman came to her and said, I know that you are Princess Hadbor, that you are searching for Hermod. He is on this island, but it will be hard for you to get to him if you have no one to help you, for you cannot climb the cliffs by your own strength. I have therefore let down a rope by which you will be able to climb up and as the island is so large that you might not find Hammer's dwelling place so easily, I lay down this clue beside you. You need only hold the end of the thread, and the clue will run on before and show you the way. I also lay this belt beside you, to put on when you awaken. It will keep you from growing faint with hunger. The woman now disappeared, and had for woke and saw that all her dream had been true. The rope hung down from the cliff, and the clue in the belt lay beside her. The belt she put on, the rope enabled her to climb up the cliff, and the clue led her on till she came to the mouth of a cave, which was not very big. She went into the cave and saw there a low couch, under which she crept and lay down. When evening came, she heard the noise of footsteps outside, and became aware that the lion had come to the mouth of the cave, and shook itself there, after which she heard a man coming towards the couch. She was sure this was Hermod, because she had heard him speaking to himself about his own condition, and calling to mind Hadbor and other things in the old days. Hadbor made no sign, but waited till he had fallen asleep and then crept out and burned the lion's skin which he had left outside. She then went back into the cave and wakened Hermod, and they had a most joyful meeting. In the morning they talked over their plans, and were most of the losses to how to get out of the island. Hadbor told Hermod her dream, and said that she suspected there was someone in the island who would be able to help. Hermod said he knew of a witch there, who was ready to help anyone, and that the only plan was to go to her. So they went to the witch's cave, and found her there with her fifteen young sons, and asked her to help them to get to the mainland. There are other things easier than that, said she, but the giant that was buried will be waiting for you, and will attack you on the way as he has turned himself into a big whale. I shall lend you a boat, however. And if you meet the whale and think your lives are in danger, then you can name me by name. They thanked her greatly for her help and advice, and set out from the island. But on the way they saw a huge fish coming towards them, with great splashing and dashing of waves. They were sure of what it was, and they thought they had a good a reason as ever to call upon the witch, and so they did. The next minute they saw coming after them another huge whale, <laughs> followed by fifteen smaller ones. All of them swam past the boat and went on to meet the whale. There was a fierce battle then, and the sea became so stormy that it was not very easy to keep the boat from being filled by the waves. After this fight had gone on for some time, they saw that the sea was dyed with blood. The big whale and the fifteen smaller ones disappeared and they got to land, safe and sound. And now the story goes back to the king's hall, where strange things had happened in the meantime. The queen and her daughter had disappeared, but a rat and a mouse were always fighting with each other there. Now, ever so many people had tried to drive them away, but no one could manage it. Thus some time went on while the king was almost beside himself with sorrow and care for the loss of his queen, and because these monsters destroyed all mirth in the hall. One evening, however, where they all sat dull and downhearted, in came Hermod with a sword by his side and saluted the king, 
who received him with the greatest joy, as if he had come back from the dead. Before Hermod sat down, however, he went to where the rat and mouse were fighting, and cut them in two with his sword. All were astonished then by seeing two witches lying dead on the floor of the hall. Hermod now told the whole story to the king, who was very glad to be rid of such vile creatures. Next he asked for the hand of Hadvor, which the king readily gave him, and now being an old man gave the kingdom to him as well. And so Hermod became king. Olaf married a good-looking nobleman, and... And that is the end of the story. Oh, and chapter 45. Chapter 46 of the Yellow Fairy Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. The Yellow Fairy Book. Edited by Andrew Lang. Chapter 46 The Steadfast Tin Soldier. There were once upon a time five and twenty tin soldiers all brothers, as they were made out of the same old tin spoon. Their uniform was red and blue, and they shouldered their guns and looked straight in front of them. The first words that they heard in this world, when the lid of the box in which they lay was taken off, were, Hurrah! Tin soldiers! This was exclaimed by a little boy, clapping his hands. They had been given to him because it was his birthday, and now he began setting them out on the table. Each soldier was exactly like the other in shape, except just one, who had been made last when the tin had run short. But there he stood as firmly on his one leg as the others did on two, and he is the one that became famous. There were many other playthings on the table on which they were being set out, but the nicest of all was a pretty little castle made of cardboard, with windows through which you could see into the rooms. In front of the castle stood some little trees surrounding a tiny mirror which looked like a lake. Wax swans were floating about and reflecting themselves in it, that was all very pretty, but the most beautiful thing was a little lady, who stood in the open doorway. She was cut out of paper, but she had on a dress of the finest muslin, with a scarf of narrow blue ribbon around her shoulders, fastened in the middle with a glittering rose made of gold paper, which was as large as her head. The little lady was stretching out both her arms, for she was a dancer, and was lifting up one leg so high in the air that the tin soldier couldn't find it anywhere and thought that she, too, had only one leg. "'That's the wife for me,' he thought. "'But she is so grand and lives in a castle, whilst I have only a box with four and twenty others. This is no place for her, but I must make her acquaintance.' Then he stretched himself out behind a snuff-box that lay on the table. From thence he could watch the dainty little lady, who continued to stand on one leg without losing her balance. When the night came, all the other tin soldiers went into their box, and the people of the house went to bed. Then the toys began to play at visiting, dancing, and fighting. The tin soldiers rattled in their box, for they wanted to be out too, but they could not raise the lid. The nutcrackers played at leapfrog, and the slate pencil ran about the slate. There was such a noise that the canary woke up and began to talk to them, in poetry too. The only two who did not stir from their places were the tin soldier and the little dancer. She remained on tiptoe, with both arms outstretched. He stood steadfastly on his one leg, never moving his eyes from her face. The clock struck twelve, and crack! Off flew the lid of the snuff-box, but there was no snuff inside, only a little black imp. That was the beauty of it. "'Hello, tin soldier,' said the imp. "'Don't look at things that aren't intended for the likes of you.' But the tin soldier took no notice, and seemed not to hear. "'Very well. Wait till tomorrow,' said the imp. When it was morning and the children had got up, the tin soldier was put in the window. And whether it was the wind or the black little imp, I don't know, but all at once the window flew open, and out fell the little tin soldier, head over heels, from the third story window. That was a terrible fall, I can tell you. He landed on his head with his leg in the air, his gun being wedged between two paving stones. The nursery maid and the little boy came down at once to look for him. But though they were so near him that they almost trod on him, they did not notice him. 
If the tin soldier had only cried out, Here I am, they must have found him. But he did not think it fitting for him to cry out, because he had on his uniform. Soon it began to drizzle, then the drops came faster, and then there was a regular downpour. When it was over, two little street boys came along. Just look, cried one, here is a tin soldier. He shall sail up and down in a boat. So they made a little boat out of newspaper, put the tin soldier in it, and made him sail up and down the gutter. Both the boys ran along beside him, clapping their hands. What great waves there were in the gutter! What a swift current! The paper boat tossed up and down, and in the middle of the stream it went so quick that the tin soldier trembled. But he remained steadfast, showed no emotion, looked straight in front of him, shouldering his gun. All at once the boat passed under a long tunnel that was as dark as his box had been. Where can I be coming now? he wondered. Oh, dear, this is the black imp's fault. Ah, oh, if only the little lady were sitting beside me in the boat. It might be twice as dark for all I should care. Suddenly there came along a great water rat that lived in the tunnel. Have you a passport? asked the rat. Out with your passport. But the tin soldier was silent and grasped his gun more firmly. The boat sped on and the rat behind it. Oh, how he showed his teeth! As he cried to the chips of wood and straw, Hold him, hold him! He has not paid the toll! He has not shown his passport! But the current became swifter and stronger. The tin soldier could already see daylight where the tunnel ended, but in his ears there sounded a roaring enough to frighten any brave man. Only think, at the end of the tunnel the gutter discharged itself into a great canal. That would be just as dangerous for him as it would be for us to go down a waterfall. Now he was so near to it that he could not hold on any longer. On went the boat, the poor tin soldier keeping himself as stiff as he could go. No one should say of him afterwards that he had flinched. The boat whirled three, four times round, and became filled to the brim with water. It began to sink. The tin soldier was standing up to his neck in water, and deeper and deeper sank the boat, and softer and softer grew the paper. Now the water was over his head. He was thinking of the pretty little dancer, whose face he should never see again. And there sounded in his ears, over and over again, Forward, forward, soldier bold, death's before thee, grim and cold. The paper came in two, and the soldier fell, but at that moment he was swallowed by a great fish. Oh, how dark it was inside, even darker than in the tunnel, and was really very close quarters. But there the steadfast little tin soldier lay full length, shouldering his gun. Up and down swam the fish, then he made the most dreadful contortions, and became suddenly quite still. Then it was as if a flash of lightning had passed through him. The daylight streamed in, and a voice exclaimed, Why, here is the little tin soldier! The fish had been caught, taken to market, sold, and brought into the kitchen, where the cook had cut it open with a great knife. She took up the soldier between her finger and thumb, and carried him into the room where everyone wanted to see the hero who had been found inside a fish. But the tin soldier was not at all proud. They put him on the table, and no, but what strange things do happen in this world. The tin soldier was in the same room in which he had been before. He saw the same children, and the same toys on the table, and there was the same grand castle with the pretty little dancer. She was still standing on one leg with the other high in the air. She, too, was steadfast. That touched the tin soldier. He was nearly going to shed tin tears, but that would not have been fitting for a soldier. He looked at her, but said nothing. All at once one of the little boys took up the tin soldier and threw him into the stove, giving no reasons. But doubtless the little black imp in the snuff-box was at the bottom of this, too. There the tin soldier lay, and felt a heat that was truly terrible. But whether he was suffering from actual fire, or from the ardour of his passion, he did not know. All his colour had disappeared. Whether this had happened on his travels, or whether it was the result of trouble, who can say? He looked at the little lady, she looked at him, and he felt that he was melting, but he remained steadfast with his gun at his shoulder. Suddenly a door opened. The draught caught up the little dancer, and off she flew like a sylph to the tin soldier in the stove, burst into flames, and that was the end of her. Then the tin soldier melted down into a little lump, 
and when the next morning the maid was taking out the ashes, she found him in the shape of a heart. There was nothing left of the little dancer but her gilt rose, burnt as black as a cinder. End of chapter 46「Far away in the country lay an old manor house where lived an old squire who had two sons. They thought themselves so clever that if they had known only half of what they did know, it would have been quite enough. They both wanted to marry the king's daughter, for she had proclaimed that she would have for her husband the man who knew best how to choose his words. Both prepared for the wooing a whole week, which was the longest time allowed them. But, after all, it was quite long enough, for they both had preparatory knowledge, and every one knows how useful that is. One knew the whole Latin dictionary, and also three years' issue of the daily paper of the town off by heart, so that he could repeat it all backwards or forwards as you pleased. The other had worked at the laws of corporation, and knew by heart what every member of the corporation ought to know so that he thought he could quite well speak on state matters and give his opinion. He understood besides this how to embroider braces with roses and other flowers, and scrolls, for he was very ready with his fingers. "'I shall win the king's daughter!' they both cried. Their old father gave each of them a fine horse. The one who knew the whole dictionary and the daily paper by heart had a black horse, while the other one who was so clever at corporation law had a milk-white one. Then they oiled the corners of their mouths, so that they might be able to speak more fluently. All the servants stood in the courtyard, and saw them mount their steeds, and here by chance came the third brother, for the squire had three sons, but nobody counted him with his brothers, for he was not so learned as they were, and he was generally called Blockhead Hans. "'Oh, oh!' said Blockhead Hans. "'Where are you off to?' "'You are in your Sunday best clothes. "'We are going to court to woo the princess. "'Don't you know what is known throughout all the countryside?' "'And they told him all about it. "'Hurrah! I'll go, too!' cried Blockhead Hans. "'And the brothers laughed at him and rode off. "'Dear father!' cried Blockhead Hans. "'I must have a horse, too. "'What a desire for marriage has seized me! "'If she will have me, she will have me. "'And if she won't have me, I will have her.' "'Stop that nonsense,' said the old man. "'I will not give you a horse. You can't speak. You don't know how to choose your words. Your brothers. Ah, they are very different lads.' "'Well,' said Blockhead Hans, "'if I can't have a horse, I will take the goat which is mine. He can carry me.' And he did so. He sat astride on the goat, struck his heels into its side, and went rattling down the high road like a hurricane.' Hoppity hop, what a ride! Here I come! shouted Blockhead Hans, singing so that the echoes were roused far and near. But his brothers were riding slowly in front. They were not speaking, but they were thinking over all the good things that they were going to say, for everything had to be thought out. Hello! bawled Blockhead Hans. Here I am! Just look what I found on the road! And he showed them a dead crow which he had picked up. Blockhead, said his brothers, what are you going to do with it? With the crow? I shall give it to the princess. Do so, certainly, they said, laughing loudly and riding on. Slap! Bang! Here I am again. Look what I have just found. You don't find such things every day on the road. And the brothers turned round to see what in the world he could have found. Blockhead, said they, that is an old wooden shoe without the top. "'Are you going to send that, too, to the princess?' "'Of course I shall,' returned Blockhead Hans. And the brothers laughed and rode on a good way. 
Slap, bang, here I am, cried Blockhead Hans. Better and better. It is really famous. What have you found now? asked the brothers. Oh, said Blockhead Hans, it is really too good. How pleased the princess will be. Why, said the brothers, this is pure mud straight from the ditch. Of course it is, said Blockhead Hans, and it is the best kind. Look how it runs through one's fingers. And so saying, he filled his pocket with the mud. But the brothers rode on so fast that dust and sparks flew all around, and they reached the gate of the town a good hour before Blockhead Hans. Here came the suitors, numbered according to their arrival, and they were ranged in rows, six in each row, and they were so tightly packed that they could not move their arms. This was a very good thing, for otherwise they would have torn each other in pieces, merely because the one was in front of the other. All the country people were standing round the king's throne, and were crowded together in thick masses almost out of the windows to see the princess receive the suitors. And as each one came into the room all his fine phrases went out like a candle. "'It doesn't matter,' said the princess. "'Away, out with him!' At last she came to the row in which the brother who knew the dictionary by heart was. But he did not know it any longer. He had quite forgotten it in the rank and file. And the floor creaked, and the ceiling was all made of glass mirrors, so that he saw himself standing on his head. And by each window were standing three reporters and an editor. And each of them was writing down what was said, to publish it in the paper that came out and was sold at the street corners for a penny. It was fearful, and they had made up the fire so hot that it was grilling. "'It is hot in here, isn't it?' said the suitor. "'Of course it is. My father is roasting young chickens to-day,' said the princess. Ahem! There he stood, like an idiot. He was not prepared for such a speech. He did not know what to say, although he wanted to say something witty. Ahem! It doesn't matter, said the princess. Take him out. And out he had to go. Now the other brother entered. How hot it is, he said. Of course. We are roasting young chickens today, remarked the princess. How do you, um, he said. And the reporters wrote down. How do you, um, it doesn't matter, said the princess. Take him out. Now Blockhead Hans came in. He rode his goat right into the hall. I say, how roasting hot it is here, said he. Of course, I am roasting young chickens today, said the princess. That's good, replied Blockhead Hans. Then can I roast a crow with them? With the greatest of pleasure, said the princess. But have you anything you can roast them in? for I have neither pot nor saucepan. Oh, rather, said Blockhead Hans, here is a cooking implement with tin rings. And he drew out the old wooden shoe and laid the crow in it. That is quite a meal, said the princess. But where shall we get the soup from? I've got that in my pocket, said Blockhead Hans. I have so much that I can quite well throw some away. And he poured some mud out of his pocket. I like you, said the princess. You can answer, and you can speak, and I will marry you. But do you know that every word which we are saying and have said has been taken down, and will be in the paper to-morrow? By each window do you see there are standing three reporters and an old editor. And this old editor is the worst, for he doesn't understand anything. But she said this to tease Blockhead Hans. And the reporters giggled, and each dropped a blot of ink on the floor. "'Ah, oh, are those the great people?' said Blockhead Hans. "'Then I will give the editor the best!' So saying, he turned his pockets inside out, and threw the mud right in his face. "'That was neatly done,' said the princess. "'I couldn't have done it, but I will soon learn how to.' Blockhead Hans became king, got a wife and a crown, and sat on the throne. And this we have still damp from the newspaper of the editor and the reporters, and they are not to be believed for a moment. End of chapter 47 Recording by Miranda Stinson Chapter 48 of the Yellow Fairy Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Christy Nowak The Yellow Fairy Book Edited by Andrew Lang Chapter 48 A Story About a Darning Needle There was once a darning needle who thought herself so fine that she believed she was an embroidery needle. 
"'Take great care to hold me tight,' said the darning needle to the fingers who were holding her. "'Don't let me fall. If I once fall on the ground I shall never be found again. I am so fine.' "'It is all right,' said the fingers, seizing her round the waist. "'Look, I am coming with my train,' said the darning needle, as she drew a long thread after her, but there was no knot at the end of the thread. The fingers were using the needle on the cook's shoe. The upper leather was unstitched and had to be sewn together. "'This is common work,' said the darning needle. "'I shall never get through it. I am breaking! I am breaking!' And, in fact, she did break. "'Didn't I tell you so?' said the darning needle. I am too fine. Now she is good for nothing, said the fingers, but they had to hold her tight while the cook dropped some sealing wax on the needle and stuck it in the front of her dress. Now I am a breast pin, said the darning needle. I always knew I should be promoted. When one is something, one will become something. And she laughed to herself. You can never see when a darning needle is laughing. Then she sat up as proudly as if she were in a state coach and looked all round her. "'May I be allowed to ask if you are gold?' she said to her neighbor, the pin. "'You have a very nice appearance, and a peculiar head, but it is so small. "'You must take pains to make it grow, for it is not every one who has a head of sealing wax.' And so saying, the darning needle raised herself up so proudly that she fell out of the dress, right into the sink, which the cook was rinsing out. "'Now I am off on my travels!' said the darning needle. I do hope I shan't get lost. She did indeed get lost. I am too fine for this world, said she as she lay in the gutter, but I know who I am, and that is always a little satisfaction. And the darning needle kept her proud bearing and did not lose her good temper. All kinds of things swam over her, shavings, bits of straw, and scraps of old newspapers. "'Just look how they sail along,' said the darning needle. "'They don't know what is underneath them. "'Here I am, sticking fast. "'There goes a shaving, thinking of nothing in the world but of itself, a mere chip. "'There goes a straw. "'Well, how it does twist and twirl, to be sure. "'Don't think so much about yourself, or you will be knocked against a stone. "'There floats a bit of newspaper. "'What is written on it is long ago forgotten, and yet how proud it is. "'I am sitting patient and quiet.' I know who I am, and that is enough for me. One day something thick lay near her which glittered so brightly that the darning needle thought it must be a diamond, but it was a bit of bottle glass, and because it sparkled the darning needle spoke to it and gave herself out as a breast pin. No doubt you are a diamond? Yes, something of that kind. And each believed that the other was something very costly, and they both said how very proud the world must be of them. I have come from a lady's work-box said the darning needle, and this lady was a cook. She had five fingers on each hand, anything so proud as these fingers I have never seen, and yet they were only there to take me out of the work-box and to put me back again. Were they of noble birth, then? asked the bit of bottle glass. Of noble birth, said the darning needle. No, indeed, but proud. They were five brothers, all called fingers. They held themselves proudly one against the other, although they were of different sizes. The outside one, the thumb, was short and fat. He was outside the rank, and had only one bend in his back, and could only make one bow, that if he were cut off from a man that he was no longer any use as a soldier. Dip into everything, the second finger dipped into sweet things as well as sour things, pointed to the sun and the moon, and guided the pen when they wrote. Long man, the third, looked at the others over his shoulder. Gold man, the fourth, had a gold sash around his waist, and little playman did nothing at all, and was the more proud. There was too much ostentation, so I came away. And now we are sitting and shining here, said the bit of bottle glass. At that moment more water came into the gutter. It streamed over the edges and washed the bit of bottle glass away. Ah, now he has been promoted, said the darning needle. I remain here. I am too fine. But that is my pride, which is a sign of respectability. And she sat there very proudly thinking lofty thoughts. I really believe I must have been born a sunbeam, I am so fine. It seems to me as if the sunbeams are always looking under the water for me. Ah, I am so fine that my own mother cannot find me. If I had my old eye which broke off, I believe I could weep, but I can't. It is not fine to weep. One day two street urchins were playing and waiting in the gutter, picking up old nails, pennies, and such things. It was rather dirty work, but it was a great delight to them. "'Oh, oh!' 
cried out one as he pricked himself with a darning needle. He is a fine fellow, though. I am not a fellow, I am a young lady, said the darning needle, but no one heard. The sealing wax had gone, and she had become quite black, but black makes one look very slim, and so she thought she was even finer than before. Here comes an eggshell sailing along, said the boys, and they stuck the darning needle into the eggshell. The walls white and eye black, what a pretty contrast it makes, said the darning needle. Now I can be seen to advantage. If only I am not seasick, I should give myself up for lost. But she was not seasick, and did not give herself up. It is a good thing to be steeled against seasickness. Here one has indeed an advantage over man. Now my qualms are over. The finer one is the more one can beat. Crack, said the eggshell as a wagon wheel went over it. Oh, how it presses, said the darning needle. I shall indeed be seasick now. I am breaking. But she did not break. Although the wagon wheel went over her, she lay there at full length, and there she may lie. End of chapter 48 End of the Yellow Fairy Book Edited by Andrew Lang